Okay, so um, good morning, everybody. Uh, I am Luis Felipe Andrade. I am the agribusiness partner at uh, the law firm Veirano Advogados, uh, and I'll be the moderator of today's uh, session uh, in which we will be talking about biotechnology in agribusiness from a Flemish and Brazilian perspective. This uh, webinar, therefore, uh, will be in English. Um, we have, uh, I know we have a, a foreign audience as well, so I would like to extend my welcome to everyone outside Brazil too. Uh, and uh, the purpose of this uh, webinar, the main purpose, of course, is to foster integration between Flanders uh, and Brazil. Uh, and we have chosen biotechnology in agribusiness uh, due to uh, the strong uh, background of Flanders in this field uh, and, and also in R&D in general in agriculture uh, and the importance of Brazil as, uh, as a large agriculture uh, country uh, in the world. So uh, I believe this will be a very uh, profitable um, session. Uh, we will be having interesting discussions with uh, uh, a set of uh, of speakers that are extremely qualified and uh, with a large experience, both here from Brazil and also uh, from Flanders. So I, I hope uh, this is an enjoyable session for all of you. Uh, it will be structured basically in the first hour uh, in, in a conversation between me and the speakers. Uh, the speakers will also have the liberty to uh, talk to each other in this uh, session. Uh, and in the last half hour, we will have 20 minutes of, uh, of our round table and uh, the last 10 minutes for questions uh, from the audience. Uh, you may send your questions uh, through the chat here and uh, we will uh, hopefully we'll be able to answer them all. Uh, and if not, uh, you also have the chance to uh, answer the uh, to ask the questions directly to our speakers as their uh, information will be made available to all of you. Uh, so uh, this will be uh, um, a very, um, we hope, a very comprehensive session with uh, both a business and an academic uh, perspective. Uh, and we will have also uh, an interesting uh, regulator participation. Uh, so I, I suppose that uh, mostly we'll be covering everything that is relevant in biotech, in agriculture in Brazil and, and the Flanders scenario. Uh, and I, we will start by uh, taking the liberty to quickly read the bio of our participants because I've, I think they are very interesting to it's very interesting to understand uh, their experience uh, and, and also their qualifications so we can uh, uh, give you as much information as possible for you to prepare your questions or even reach out to them depending on your needs as well. So uh, today we will have four uh, speakers uh, and uh, we'll, I will start uh, talking to, they're all PhDs by the way, highly qualified. Uh, I will start with uh, Dr. Patricia Machado Bueno Fernandes. Uh, she's a full professor at the Federal University of Espírito Santo with a degree of doctor in biochemistry obtained at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro and Princeton University. She also accomplished a postdoc at Princeton University in 2011. She has a vast international experience in the field of biotech, uh, which she has developed in various countries, including Belgium. And nowadays, she is also president of the Internal Biosafety Commission at the Federal University of Espírito Santo and a member of the National Technical Commission on Biosafety of the Ministry of Science, Technology of Innovation, City and Bio, the Brazilian regula regulator for biotechnology. Uh, then I will uh, talk to Dr. Otto Abrão. He is a director of uh, biotechnology at CropLife Brazil, uh, one of the most important industry associations in the field of, uh, of uh, biotech in agriculture. Uh, he is an agronomist engineer by Universidade de São Paulo, University of São Paulo. He is a specialist in rural administration by uh, Fundação Getúlio Vargas, FGV. 
and has a doctor degree in molecular biology obtained at the Nucleus Center in Agriculture, Sena. In his professional career, he worked in the regulatory department at Monsanto and, le and led the regulatory affairs at uh, a company called Futrageni, developing the risk assessment of the first genetically modified eucalyptus approved in the world. So he has a very interesting experience uh, also submitting and, and deregulating um, GMOs. Then we have uh, Dr. Lawrence uh, Powells uh, from, Flend from the Flanders region. He's a staff scientist and manager uh, of crop genome engineering facility since 2017 at the Flemish Institute of Biotechnology, VIB. Uh, Lawrence obtained his PhD in biotechnology at the University and is a former postdoctoral scientist at the University of California, Davis, and at the Department of Plant Systems Biology at VIB and Ghent University. Uh, the research in his group currently focuses on improving methods for CRISPR delivery and plant regeneration. So we will have a very uh, interesting uh, discussion as well on new technologies um, that Dr. Powers is uh, working on. Uh, finally, we will have Dr. Marcelo Domaral uh, bringing uh, a business perspective here and also an interesting Flemish and slash Brazilian perspective as uh, he uh, he is currently the head of Global East, a company that had a Flemish DNA and now is uh, fully Brazilian owned, but uh, yeah, I'm sure he has a lot of, to share about uh, his uh, um, um, experience with both uh, Flanders Belgium and, and Brazil. Uh, Dr. Marcelo is an experienced executive in the field of chemical engineering with a PhD at the Universidad del País Vasco, Spain. In his professional career, he worked at uh, as technology and innovation manager at Heisen and senior manager at Accenture. Nowadays, he's the CEO at Global East, a Brazilian biotech company with Flemish DNA, just like I said. Uh, and uh, I will introduce as well our host, uh, and I would like to thank him and all his team uh, for the opportunity to moderate and, and have this session today uh, from Flanders Trade and Investment, uh, Mr. Dirk Champelier. Dirk was uh, the commercial director for Alcatel in China, Colombia and Argentina. Uh, after his career at Alcatel, he was consul at the Embassy of Belgium in Serbia. Since 2013, he works as Investment and Trade Commissioner at Flanders Investment and Trade, responsible for all the economic and investment topics for the region of Flanders in Brazil. Before moving to Brazil, he acted as Commissioner in China. So, uh, Dirk, if you can uh, share a few words uh, with our audience and open formally this webinar, uh, please feel free, the mic is yours. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Luis Felipe, uh, for co-hosting uh, the seminar. Uh, to the audience, uh, heartily welcome. Uh, uh, good morning, Brazil. Good afternoon in Belgium. Um, so maybe some words. Uh, who are we? Um, so we are Flanders Investment and Trade. Yeah, Flanders Investment and Trade, it's a, a government agency. Uh, supporting Flemish companies uh, doing business abroad and com foreign companies who are looking to set up or expand operations in, in Flanders. Here we are part of uh, the Belgian Embassy. Uh, we, we represent Flanders, uh, which is the northern region of, um, of Belgium. So what do we do? Our task is, is twofold. Eh? First of all, to promote uh, international entrepreneurship uh, of Flemish businesses, uh, especially small and medium enterprises, but furthermore, to attract foreign investment into Flanders. Now, when I'm talking about foreign investment, I'm not only talking about the commercial aspect. I think it goes way beyond this. We also are talking about attracting know-how, knowledge, because in Flanders, we bet heavily on innovation. And we strongly believe um, into the working with the, within the triple helix, uh, a strong interworking between the industry, the government and uh, the academical world. So hence today we have 
in this webinar representatives of all these sectors, uh, both as speakers as uh, within our uh, audience. Now, this uh, webinar is uh, really meant to bring our two ecosystems, being biotech and agrotech, from both sides together yeah, to get a glimpse of what we both can bring to the plate and to offer a kind of platform to start further fruitful corporations, both in the academic as in the commercial field. Now, at the end of uh, the webinar, we will share the contact details of the members of uh, the panel. So you can either, either contact uh, the speakers of the panel or with Filippo and myself if you want to further elaborate or explore certain topics. Now, you might wonder, Flanders, why, why would we consider Flanders? Um, at the end of the day, Flanders has only 13,000 square uh, kilometers, which is one twentieth, it's 5% of the uh, surface of the state of Sao Paulo. Well, I would say small is beautiful because we have quite some interesting, uh, unique uh, selling points. And we are not only located in the center of Europe, and we're home to the European decision makers. Yeah, the Council of the U European Union is amongst uh, us. We are great in logistics, um, not only because we have the port of Antwerp, the second biggest port in Europe, and the second biggest uh, petrochemical cluster of the Houston worldwide. But now, especially with uh, the whole COVID-19 pandemic, uh, both Pfizer, uh, GSK and Johnson & Johnson will use their um, Belgian production and distribution centers uh, as main hubs to distribute uh, the different uh, vaccines uh, uh, within Europe. What we also have to offer is a very great educational system. So we, we do score constantly very high in the different PISA scores. And we are number one uh, in, within Europe as far as maths are concerned, and number three in um, science. So it's no wonder if we add this on top of the fact that we have five universities uh, within this very small area, two of which are in the top 100 uh, worldwide. And so it's not no wonder that we are considered as one of the most innovative regions in the world. So we invest in Flanders nearly 3% of our GDP in R&D, which is way above the European average. Yes, so further on, besides um, this investment, we can count on generous fiscal and financial incentives to further boost our R&D. Um, so it's really all about innovation in, in, in Flanders. And one of them for sure is within the field of life science. And today we will only touch upon one part of life science, the biotech applicable for agrosector. But just to give you a rough idea, within the small region of Flanders, we can count on 300 dedicated life science organizations. And within Flanders, biotech ranks third when it comes to R&D investment. And maybe um, it could be a surprise, but 18% of the EU biotech market capital is generated in Flanders. So this makes it very attractive for your knowledge centers, your universities, and also your companies to join forces with the know-how we have available. So that's the purpose of, of, of this uh, webinar. Uh, I will stop here, but I will just give you one example. Uh, last year, a uh, well-known American uh, biotech uh, company, Inari, uh, they crossed the Atlantic and they ended uh, opening up uh, their first R&D facility outside uh, the States. And where did it happen? Of course, in Flanders, near to Ghent, where we have the equivalent of the Silicon value, but there is called our biotech value. So with this move, uh, Inaru uh, underlined their ambition to develop uh, next generation seeds yeah, that makes crops higher yielding and more resilient in the face of uh, climate changes. So without any further ado, I will leave now the floor back to Luis Felipe and wish you an interesting uh, and enriching webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dirk. Uh, I would like just to add that uh, when I saw the material from Flanders Trade and Investment in, in the R&D 
for agriculture, I was absolutely uh, stunned by the the level and the 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 range of research being done there. So they they cover uh, basically every single high tech area uh, for agriculture um, that is being discussed uh, globally. So uh, pretty interesting to check as well. And in, anybody interested can can reach Dirk for that material too. Uh, so, uh, Patricia, Dr. Patricia, you, uh, it's a privilege to, to have you here. I would like to start with you uh, and uh, I would like to thank you for being here. Uh, your experience as a regulator is uh, uh, extremely interesting and uh, uh, as far as I know, uh, very much connected uh, with, with actually the, the age of our biosafety legislation. We have you know, this year we celebrate 15 years of our biosafety legislation, and uh, uh, I think you've been uh, at City and Bio most of this time, so you've seen it all. Uh, so I would like to start by asking you, uh, as a regulator, um, you have also the scientist perspective, which I intend to explore later on, but as a regulator, uh, tell us a little bit about your experience in these last 15 years, uh, what you saw in terms of evolution of uh, the technology, how you position, uh, uh, how the regulator has positioned itself uh, in the past, now, and what you're seeing for the future in terms of uh, development, uh, uh, developments in this area as well. Okay. Good morning, good morning everybody, good afternoon for whoever is watching us from abroad. And thank you very much for inviting me. I'm really pleased to um, be here and um, mostly um, we have, I have been in Flanders several times uh, mostly in Leuven at the Univer Catholic University of Leuven that I have a uh, strong collaboration with uh, Professor Eveline that now is uh, retired, but I've visited VIP at the uh, Ghent and been around and really spectacular place. So I'm really glad to be in this seminar and I, I think um, Brazil and the biotech area, Brazil and Flanders have lots to, uh, we are really, we have lots to collaborate. We are really going to be able to collaborate in the area of uh, biotech and the research. We've been really um, lots of um, things that we have in common and and regarding this, uh, the matter of uh, regulator, our law, yes, I've, I've been there since the beginning, um, uh, 2005. The, the law, the Brazilian law uh, started earlier on, um, but because lots of problems, it stopped. And then there was a new law, and this law started in 2005. And in 2005, things really changed for Brazil in biotech. So everything that deals with GMO and derivatives in Brazil has to go through CTN Bio. And everything, I mean, research and in the laboratory, in the field, and in the, and for commercialization. So we deal in, people talk about a lot when they say about GMO, they talk a lot about commodities, soy, soybean, maize, cotton, G CTN Bio deals with everything, microorganisms, vaccines, and, and all types of microorganisms and, well, everything. And even in the laboratory, if anyone is just studying how the things work, it goes through 
CGN bio. So, and and in the lab, when we started in 2005, actually, we had we have been uh, the, Brazil was had lots of things that had stopped it. So actually, yes, we only we had lots of things to deal with, like lots of commodities had to go through. But nowadays it's a completely new story. We do have been looking at, but so many new things can, have been coming through. So many new, not only new trades on plants, but so many new microorganisms, so many new genes in microorganisms, and mostly so many. Um, we now have CRISPR, and so we have the new breeding technology, and we have also, uh, we have to consider also if you're going to stay say if it is GMO or if it's not going to be considered GMO because the, also Brazil have a statement that if it, it can be done in a in a manner that is not uh, transgenic it could be a cisgenic then it's not considered a GMO so it is really interesting nowadays in at CTN Bio. So we have. Yes, uh, uh, I will. I will. Um, in the end, uh, in the roundtable, I'll pose a question, in which I, I hope you can uh, also uh, talk about uh, your feelings about what's really promising that you're seeing at CTN Bio in terms of the technologies coming. Over, uh, you mentioned CRISPR. We we will talk a little bit more about that as well uh, with the other participants too. Uh, so I'll, I'll I'll try to save that for the roundtable. Um, yeah. That that particular yeah. question. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So so, sure. so you, you can share that too. So uh, you, you talked about your regulatory perspective as uh, uh, you know being inside the regulatory body. Um, and I, I would like to hear a, a little bit about your um, your scientist pers perspective in terms of uh, what's Brazil doing? Uh, how is uh, how is Brazil taking uh, the opportunities of biotech uh, in in research uh, in in academia? Uh, if this is generating interest to to students, uh, uh, and also if we are. In, in good paths to develop interesting solutions and, and products, uh, particularly for agriculture, which is our scope here. So if you can talk a little bit about that, uh, it will be uh, interesting to hear from you. Yeah, I believe that Brazil has done a long, from a long investment on, on science and technology mainly on the area of biotechnology. It's ups and downs, we know. That's how things work in Brazil. Uh, so it's ups and downs, but it's a long investment. And in the agribusiness, we, we have uh, in both areas. In research, we have very strong, both in the, in the mainly uh, com uh, we have Embrapa, okay? So we, Embrapa makes a big difference. And what I think it's incredible good in Brazil is that this partnership between Embrapa and the universities. And this is a, a success case. It's a case of success. So when we are talking about the universities, we have nowadays 68 uh, graduate uh, programs in biotechnology. Around those, th about around 30% are in the area of agribusiness. So it is a considerable amount. Mm -hmm. And if so, they are 
doing research specific for this, for the agribusiness. And they do, if, and they collaborate, most of them collaborate, not around, uh, between them, but also if you have to consider, well, I told about Zimbabwe, but there are also some states that have their own research institutes, like the state that I am at, have one in Cape, they have, uh, they're very much in the entire state and they do research and the researchers are members of the graduate program. So they do have collaboration. So more and also there are the, the technical schools in Brazil. The technical schools are all over the country. Mm -hmm. So we are former technicians, very high qualified technicians. We have some in biotech. We have graduate school, undergraduate schools in biotech. There are not so many, but we do have now. And we have graduate school. So we have RD in several levels, very well qualified working on this. So what I really believe that through a long investment a structure was created in Brazil. In biotech. Great. Great. Uh, we are prepared. We are prepared for for uh, a fruitful collaboration, and we've been doing that. We've been doing that. Uh, if we talk, uh, like I have a collaboration. Other professors, other researchers have small collaboration, and we could do it in a, a, a much higher level and bigger and more strong and. I do believe it. Uh, that's uh, uh, a very good um, um, overview of our uh, scientific landscape in Brazil, Dr. Patricia. Uh, as I as I feared with this uh, webinar, I think each uh, speaker could take an hour and uh, give us so much uh, interesting information. But uh, uh, I need to move over to uh, to Dr. Otto now. Uh, and uh, when we have the round table, I'll get back to you uh, um, and to everyone as well. So I thank you. This has been very, uh, very interesting uh, and informative. Um, so I'll move to Otto now. Thank you, Dr. Patricia. I'll move to Otto now. Uh, uh, Otto, uh, you, um, you have, uh, uh, you bring us to this webinar the perspective from the industry. So uh, you've been uh, in the industry uh, for for a long time and now you are in a position at uh, Crop Life Brazil, which is a more recent association uh, in which uh, obviously you're going to play uh, an enormous role in, in helping shaping our uh, biotech future here and 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 enabling all sorts of co collaborations uh, and and also uh, paving the way for Brazil to to move uh, in in biotech and agriculture um, for the for the immediate and uh, long future. So uh, I would like you to give us a little bit of uh, uh, your your view and crop life's view. Uh, what, what kind of work you've been doing and uh, how you um, how do you intend uh, on working uh, uh, towards uh, achieving this uh, uh, ever increasing goal of uh, enabling biotech in Brazil. Hi everyone, good morning, good afternoon. And I would like to thank the invitation, thanking you, Felipe, especially for Verano and, and Flanders, uh, thanking the, the kind attention support from Dirk and well, first of all, I, I will talk a, a little bit about Crop Life Brazil because we, we are an, an precedent uh, initiative from the industry uh, gathering uh, different uh, old associations because we are we have less than one year 
from the launching. Now we are celebrating one year of launching CropLife Brazil. You can see lots of crop lives around the world, like regional ones or national ones. And but in Brazil, we are uh, experiencing the the, the first uh, gathering all the the, the uh, different sectors of the agri industry. So we we have we inside Crop Life Brazil the Agri Chemicals Association was called uh, before Andes. Uh, we have the Biotechnology Associations, which uh, I took part in the board AgroBio. We have the Association of Com Biological Control, it's a BCB, uh, and the Braspov is the Germoplasm Association industry, the former one. So we we gathered this in Crop Life Brazil as the first experience in, in the world having all this this different parts of the agri industry gathering in just one association, and this for for capturing the synergies of the areas and uh, sharing the 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 services like uh, legal, uh, institutional relationships, uh, uh, communication, uh, good practices in agriculture, finances. So we are having the, uh, I hope that is not the unique experience on that because we, we can expect that the, the other countries or regions, they can follow our, our steps and I will talk a little bit about our our actions uh, regarding biotech in Brazil. First of all, is is uh, monitoring and following up all the regulatory system. So, Sikini Bio is it's a very active uh, regulatory agency. So, as as Patricia told us, they they are uh, they have. Uh, members that are invited from from the academic uh, part or the, the research institutes and some of the, the academic, the private academic part. And it, it's not a, a constant body. So we have a succession of members. So we we monitor this. We we are invited to to indicate for, for uh, through public consultation process, so we can indicate researchers that are able to take part on that. Sometimes, not not for all the positions, and in some case, when is the the CTNA bio renewed, revised lots of normatives, and we took part in the public consultation, giving our suggestions to to make the normative uh, more uh, modern, more uh, adjusted to our procedures in the fields, in, in contained activities. So regulatory is, is, a, is a, one of the main issues inside the biotech chamber, which I'm the director. The other issue we deal the, the association is regarding intellectual property issues. So we have lots of legal legal suits in, in the court to, to follow. In, in some cases, we are part in, the, in this process, in these legal processes. And we, at the same time, we had like, for instance, we uh, Participated in a seminar to the to the Institute, the National Institute of Industrial Property. We we had part in a seminar for capacitating examiners in new breeding technologies. So we help them evaluating processes uh, related to these new technologies. So we, we take part on, on initiatives like that. In, in all the other topic we use to to participate is in multi multilateral agreements like CBD, biodiversity uh, protocols like uh, Nagoya or Kazu or other other uh, agreements that are are discussed around the world. So we 
we write position papers, we discuss with government when we, we detect some issue that can impact the agricultural or one of our activities. And finally, in communication, we our mission is one of our uh, mission is uh, being uh, a source of information regarding biotech in uh, agricultural use of biotech. So uh, we, we have uh, one of the, the, the associations that, that come came with us is the CIB, is the uh, Biosafety Information Council. It was a think tank uh, dealing with, with uh, information regarding biotech use in the world and in Brazil. So we are acting in all these this fronts. And additionally, uh, in the markets that are importers, and at this moment, Brazil is being considered an importer of, of commodities that use biotech and we used to be the, the the focal point for discussing some topics regarding regulation and and trade so the, the, this is a, a brief summary of the the uh, actions crop life brazil and, and are, are dealing with we we have gathered like uh, in the last uh, in the last compiled, uh, we we had like 70 topics to work in the different chambers. So it's, it's a huge amount of, of topics and issues to deal with in government, in in um, acad academy, in in the private sector, with the other associations that are dealing in the sector, in the agri sector. So. Great. Uh, um, you've had um, a long time experiencing in dealing with uh, biotechnology acceptance uh, in Brazil, Autumn, and uh, of course you participated in uh, uh, directly leading uh, the Eucalyptus GM effort, which uh, had, um, I remember, had a, a few rough patches uh, along the way. Uh, and how do you see the this uh, uh, communication and education effort uh, translating today uh, in, in in the current environment uh, uh, of acceptance of biotech uh, in general and, and in agriculture. Uh, I I can only imagine that COVID nineteen, for example, is bringing. In the, in the in the medical sector, the possibilities of of biotechnology uh, bringing us the, the the vaccine against the disease. So uh, perhaps uh, we we are uh, as a society uh, opening up a little bit more about these innovations and uh, seeing that uh, there's a lot of safety studies being done. So I would like to hear from you on that uh, particular aspect as well. Thanks, Filippi, for, for the question. And well, what I can say in, in, in my former, in my career, I, I didn't uh, tell you, but uh, I was part of the consumer uh, association here in Brazil that uh, was claiming for the, the, the framework for discussing biosafety in Brazil in the, in the 90s. So <laughs> after my PhD, I, I, I changed the side regarding the view of the use of the biotechnology and what i can say is the, the acceptance is 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 today we can say it's it, the, the consumer side this is more uh accepting the, the technology in their food we can see in brazil recently we have uh, all all the soybean products like oil and 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 other products being labeled with transgenics and the corn product, the maize product in the same way, being labeled with, with the transgenic symbol. It, it's, a, it's a yellow triangle with a, a big black T in the middle. So, and, and there is no, no reaction of that. The, the, the consumption of this product didn't, didn't decrease cause that. And we have some sectors of, of the civil society. They are uh, all the time 
monitoring the, the development of the biotechnology. Uh, and when they have the opportunity to manifest, they they do that. So Felipe mentioned the, the eucalyptus approval. The meeting at Citini was was invaded by, by a group claiming for not approving uh, GM eucalyptus because it, it will cause some damage to bees or, or to the environment or to the societies that uh, used to live around the eucalyptus plantations. So, but, uh, you know, it was, it was, uh, the evaluation was performed by Citini Bio with a huge amount of data and, and the eucalyptus was approved. And but we still have some some initiatives like uh, certification bodies or, or or civil society organizations that that make some some restrictions to use of, of GM. But uh, at the same time, we have the, the advances in agriculture. I, I bought some numbers for you, like uh, the product that Citini Bio evaluated and approved in these last 15 years, they are responsible for uh, planting more than 51 million hectares in Brazil. So considering corn, soybean and cotton. So it's, it's a case, it's a huge amount of area cultivated with biotechnologies mainly focused on, on herbicide tolerance and insect resistance, but is for sure is a success case. And, and talking about Citini Bio in the same way, uh, Citini Bio, as all the regulatory bodies, they, they are reactive of the advance observed in, in the science, but we can say Citini Bio is, is bringing the new information and revising their normative, uh, putting uh, in, in the same step of the advances we can observe in, in the sciences in terms of, of the biosafety knowledge and recognizing that that we we took a, a good, good uh, steps or a good, good way uh, developing the technology in the country. So developing Capacity in the universities, capacity in Embrapa is a, is a very important player in Brazil because, as Patricia said, uh, Embrapa makes the the, the 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 mid the intermediate the contact with the academy and with the private sector. So it's a very important player in agriculture in Brazil, and and the private sector that developed. Uh, a very strong bodies for developing technologies for using in tropical countries like Brazil. We have some some very new initiatives uh, formed in Brazil uh, for our market, specifically for our market. And the most important thing, uh, with a very well established procedure for evaluating biosafety, uh, uh, sitting by assuring that that the evaluation will be properly performed uh, and the, the private sector knowing what are the, the, the requirements, what are the, the, the kind of studies we need to run to to approve our products. This, this is something that uh, brings some security in the process so we can we can apply our 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 plans, our projects. And one one of the criticisms that we we hear from from the uh, civil organizations that used to criticize the, the biotechnology, they say everything that goes to Citini Bio is approved. Well, if the rules are, we just go ahead projects. We know that comply with all the requirements that are established in Citini Bio process. So. Uh, the project that present any any failure or any problem of performance or any risk to the biosafety, we just cut off and we don't go forward with them. So uh, it, 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 it's easy to to go ahead when you know the rules. So this is very important for for the, the plans and for the projects that the private sector develops in Brazil. 
Otum, uh, thank you very much. Uh, very clear. Um, now I'll make a shift uh, from Brazil to Flanders, uh, and uh, I think that's the interesting part of this uh, of this webinar. Uh, we we are geographically uh, now focused on uh, Flanders. And uh, Dr. Lawrence Powers has um, a lot to share with us. So, Dr. Uh, Powers, uh, welcome. Um, I've seen some of uh, the materials from the Flemish Institute of Biotech, and uh, I, I must say that it's uh, extremely impressive. So, I would like you to start by introducing a little bit um, uh, the work of, uh, of VIB in biotechnology uh, and to talk a little bit also about your focus of research and uh, give you the chance to uh, present us the level of, uh, of uh, the, the, the work that you have been doing as well. Yeah. Well, yeah, many thanks for your uh, invitation. Um, it's, a, it's a very nice initiative and uh, I think very timely also. Uh, I think there's indeed a lot of uh, synergy possible, I think, between the, the research being done in Brazil and in, in, in Flanders. Um, so indeed, I will maybe try first to introduce to you. VIB is a, is a non-profit uh, research institute in, in Flanders. Um, it is, it is quite large, yeah? so there are about uh, 1,500 researchers that are affiliated with uh, VIB. Um, and it's really focused on, on life sciences. Um, and most of the researchers are in, in the biomedical field. Also, a fairly large portion is focused on, on plant science. Um, the largest department is, is my department in, in Ghent, uh, the city of Ghent, and it's the center of plant systems biology, and it uh, has about 300 uh, researchers active. Yeah? So our research is uh, focused on, on all aspects of plant science, but also, of course, on uh, some agronomically important uh, crops. And if I think about uh, Brazil, I, one, our major crop is actually maize that we work on, um, but also we, have, we are starting a, a project on soybeans and, uh, and so on. So, um, now, maybe also important to note our, our, our thematic focus, let's say, of the department is really focused on, on the challenges. Uh, we will talk a bit more about challenges, I think, later, but it's really the, the climate change is, is really important in Europe. So our um, thematic focus is really on that. On, For example, you can think about uh, traits like drought resistance, heat resistance, that, uh, that uh, kind of traits are really a uh, focus in our department. Um, so, VIB is, is a, indeed a research institute, but we indeed foster also collaborations with industry, which is, I think, important today. So, uh, we have collaborations with all kinds of uh, businesses in, in uh, biotechnology, both small local uh, companies, but also larger uh, international uh, companies. So, very, very broad range there. Um, so, also, if we think about agriculture, um, we have a very close partnership with another institute in Flanders, which might also be important here today, which is the, it's called ILVO. It's uh, the uh, research um, laboratory for uh, fisheries and, and agriculture. And it's, um, let's say, it's a little bit more uh, to the applied sides of, of agriculture, more on agronomy, agronomy, let's say. And so we work a lot uh, together with them for, uh, for example, field trials, um, both with GM and non-GM. Um, if you talk about that, we talked already a lot about uh, uh, GM and uh, gene editing. That's also indeed my area of expertise, is indeed uh, is gene editing. Uh, but maybe also interesting for the audience to know that VIB is much broader than that, that we also have uh, research on uh, microbiome. I think it's also been mentioned already by, by Patricia uh, and, um, and other aspects of, of biotechnology, of course. So indeed, my, my own research is, is really focused on, on that, uh, on uh, gene editing. Um, and we there's, of course, a lot of opportunities there but also a lot of um, challenges uh, on a research uh, point of view. Uh, and so I'm really focused on making gene editing more applicable and also um, 
applying it to other species uh, and, and uh, other varieties within uh, species such as uh, maize. Um, and then maybe also finally, um, something I wanted to mention is that VIB is also very active in, uh, in launching uh, own uh, companies. And so one of the deliverables of our institute is really uh, making spin-off uh, companies. Um, in the past, there are some, some names that people might recognize, uh, like DevGen or, um, or Crop Design. Those were spin-off companies of, of VIB that have been acquired then later on. But also at the moment, uh, we have spin-off companies that are now um, in their Series B and Series C uh, uh, funding. Uh, for example, uh, Afea Bio, which is active in, in this microbiome field. And, uh, and BioTalis, which is more uh, in the, uh, it's actually developing biologicals um, to protect uh, uh, plants and, and also, um, uh, for example, fruits of uh, post-harvest actually, yeah. So that's a bit in a, in a nutshell, I think, uh, VIB, yeah, I think I can talk a lot more, but. Uh... Sure, uh, I will, uh, I would like to explore you two, two things actually, so. Uh, one technical, I would like to hear from you in terms of um, how has your research been impacted by uh, all the new genome editing technologies? Um, I, I suppose for you, uh, you've been in, in the, into this uh, for quite some time, but uh, I, I could only guess not being a technical expert that uh, the possibilities are, are much larger now, but I would like you to, to hear from you as well and how this has impacted in terms of everything that you find interesting to mention. I don't know, financing, timeline. Um, so that would be the first one. Uh, and the second one would be, um, does VIB currently have any partnerships with any Brazilian institutions for now, or are you looking at something that uh, you may find interesting to, to share? Uh, and on this question, do in, in your lines of research, you mentioned maize, uh, and drought tolerance. Uh, what what else do you see that is interesting uh, to to connect to Brazil, uh, to Brazil's agriculture, which is uh, pretty much tropical? So um, anything you can elaborate on these two topics will be very interesting to hear. Yeah, yeah very good question. So well, about the um, the impact of, of gene editing technology. So uh, I, I've been indeed uh, involved in gene editing for quite a long time. So uh, the the we talk a lot about CRISPR-Cas9 now, of course, but before that you had actually other technologies that could um, be used for gene editing, but they were very inefficient. Eh? So, um, of course, when CRISPR-Cas9 came along, this really changed everything because um, it made everything much more efficient. And that's why, of course, this uh, pops up uh, everywhere and, and you see the, the big impact of that. So also indeed in my, in my own research. So, of course, um, I think everybody in the world, in Brazil, but also in Europe, immediately saw the opportunities with uh, with CRISPR for um, improving crops. Um, and we have, um, it's already been mentioned, uh, a lot of the traits, uh, the typical GM traits or, or herbicide tolerance, uh, insect uh, resistance. But of course, this really um, all uh, new uh, traits to be, um, to be um, uh, modified and, and uh, in plants, uh, so this is really uh, impacted a lot uh, our research and also how we approach research. Uh, we really have more uh, a more clear vision uh, for applications. Let's say um, now about um, you also asked about collaborations with Brazil. So indeed, um, so one of the collaborations I personally have in my group is with um, the Genomics for Climate Change Research Center in in, uh, in Campinas. So this is a is a joint venture actually between Embrapa and uh, Unicam, and this is really an, an uh, also an, um, a research group that is really also focused on um, on a bit similar topics. Uh, so. Uh, also maize and also um, with the focus on climate change, so also obviously uh, drought uh, tolerance. Um, now, of course, we talked about maize, but VIV and my department is doing much more. And, and one of the things that also came already, was already mentioned was eucalyptus. Uh, uh, trees are important in Brazil. 
and forestry. And one of the major research groups in my department is, is of Wout Burian, who is uh, really a world expert in uh, lignin in plants, studying uh, lignin formation. And he has uh, research also in, on maize, but uh, also in trees, uh, poplar trees in, uh, in Belgium then, uh, for which we also are doing uh, field trials, both GM and non-GM. Um, but I know that he also already has quite some connections with Brazil, um, both with, uh, with researchers there and, and, and companies. And so maybe some of you will, will know his work. So I think also there, I see, uh, I see a lot of, uh, of possibilities of uh, um, mutual interest, let's say. Um, yeah, and, and then of course, it's, it's much more than that. Eh? So um, uh, I mentioned the microbiome. Um, one thing I also know that the VIB has uh, some, some joint IP also with, um, with the University of Rio. Uh, with Adriana Hemmerli there, uh, professor there, uh, and a company called Happy Seed. So I, I think there are lots of, of different uh, uh, possibilities and uh, possible, yeah. Oh, that's, uh, um, I'm pretty impressed by all the connections that already exist. Uh, uh, we've talked a little bit before, but uh, now you've given us a, a much uh, broader view. Uh, and uh, I think for the audience, the, the audience is very valuable because uh, folks can identify particular segments and uh, and reach out and uh, and, and see uh, if there are interesting aspects to collaborate with. So, um, Dr. Paul, is very, thank you very much. I will uh, I will pass on to our last speaker uh, in this uh, first uh, hour of of our uh, webinar. We we. I hope that uh, so far uh, everyone is uh, satisfied with this uh, presentations. They were really good. Uh, and the interesting aspect of our last speaker, I think, is that uh, Marcelo Domaral, Dr. Marcelo, can uh, provide us with uh, a view of both Brazil and, and Flanders working together uh, in, uh, from a business and in uh, the R&D standpoint. So, uh, I'm pretty sure your uh, inputs here will be very valuable and you, you will be free to cover any aspect you, you may find interesting to share, even cultural aspects that uh, you might find interesting to share as well. Um, so I, I will start. Uh, welcome, uh, Marcelo. Thank you very much. Uh, can you, the first question, uh, I'll give you the opportunity to talk a little bit about Global East and uh, uh, I think the interesting aspect is that it's uh, it's it's in an industry. It's more ag industry related. Uh, the, the the biotech uh, work you have been doing. So uh, we move a little bit away from plants and we talk a, a little bit about uh, microbes in this regard. I would say no microbes, but yeast. I'm sorry. So uh, can you talk a little bit about global yeast and uh, what, what kind of research you've been doing? You did. Uh, your experience uh, going through the regulatory process uh, and and uh, go from there. I, I will save the last question to give you the chance to talk a little bit about uh, the the connections, uh, your feelings and, and experience with the connections between Flanders and, and Brazil as well in this field. So feel free. Um, thank you very much. OK, well, Thank you, Luis Felipe. Thanks also for Flanders Investment and Trade for the invitation, uh, as well as all, our, all participants. So good morning, good afternoon. So that, that was quite a, let's say, a long question. Let me try to <laughs> put first. So, um, so I work for Global East. Global East is currently a, a provider of advanced solution for fermentation. So when we talk about biotech, uh, 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 Lawrence was uh, emphasizing the work of, of VIB in plant science, uh, but as I said, within biotech, we can also emphasize uh, industrial biotech. Uh, uh, Professor Patricia mentioned a little bit about uh, 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 industrial biotech. Uh, long story short, that is what make our life better and happier every day from the ethanol that uh, a power Brazil and other countries as well, from beer to uh, daily products from enzymes. So industrial biotech is all around. So today, uh, Global East is a key supplier 
of advanced solutions for uh, industrial fermentation. To some of your questions, Luis Felipe, uh, there is a lot uh, to be advanced on the collaboration and joining forces between Brazil and Flanders, to put on a very uh, direct way. I think that is a similar mindset, that is a synergy of forces, and there is a potential combination of uh, talents uh, and skills uh, uh, for some of the, let's say, today's challenge. So uh, bioeconomy and the support of advanced biotechnology uh, is here to stay, is a global need, is a local need. So we're not talking about what we have accomplished in the past, we're talking about necessary business, scientific, uh, uh, and society challenges as uh, we advance. So I think that when we put this context uh, in place, I do see uh, some, uh, and here's not a comparison, it's again a synergy, the skills that we have in Brazil, uh, the skills that we have in Flanders, and how we can combine to again address some of those needs. Uh, as you mentioned, I did have uh, the experience of putting forth a company and um, make it happen uh, when it comes to the actual collaboration. Uh, and, and again, my experience will be that the mindset, the drive, the preparation that we do see in Flanders, uh, it, it does help to streamline a process. Uh, let's say the skills are there, the will to collaborate is there, the same that I see in Brazil. Uh, what allows you to put as much focus as possible on the key drivers that are what are the market needs, how you come to a product to the market. Uh, so you have this mindset of uh, uh, execution and accomplishment. That is something that I would emphasize and probably would contribute, would match a lot with Brazil. So if we talk about the agro industry as a whole, uh, Brazil clearly has uh, what we call a savoir faire. Uh, 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 so Brazil feeds the world. So there is a lot of technology. Uh, Patricia mentioned, Professor Patricia, so it's not only commodities. So to beat uh, records of crop production uh, season over season, you need a lot of technology. So within the soya or the corn, or the ethanol that we consume and produce, there is a lot of technology. Combining this with other advanced technology is what we need to have, let's say, more sustainable products, less environmental impact, and, and how we deliver more. This goes to industrial biotech, and, and uh, I clearly see that the, this goes uh, also to, let's say, other reach of life science as we see now, uh, with the pandemic, the new needs of biologics and, and vaccines and other and let's say other benefits. So we do see this mindset, this collaboration, and that was the experience on uh, on putting together a, a startup uh, with a clear collaboration from both Brazil uh, and Belgium, specifically the region of Flanders, uh, when we started the Global East. Uh, back then, it was really the focus to have advanced yeast strains for the ethanol market. Uh, and let's say the mood, the uh, spirit and, and the practicalities to establish this. I think they uh, uh, found good ground to grow uh, when we talk about collaboration between Flanders uh, uh, and Brazil. Great. Uh, I really like what you said about uh, the mindset of execution and, and marketing. Uh, we are, I, my view that Brazil is really good in yeah, a lot of sectors in agriculture, but uh, I sometimes my feeling is also that we, we have a lot to uh, absorb from, from other um, um, structured uh, uh, economies in terms of uh, of really marketing and, and, and executing the final, uh, um, let's say, the final points of our uh, sales pitches and, and how we, we position ourselves. So I think that's a very interesting comment. It's a little bit away from biotech itself. It's more general, but it's a very valuable comment. Uh, and 
I, I, I also would like to hear from you because uh, when we're talking about uh, the new technologies uh, and the framework, the regulatory framework, uh, you, you've been through the, um, the approval process uh, of CTN Bio and uh, you, you actually went through the approval process uh, for new breeding technologies. So uh, I would like to hear from you on that a little bit, uh, if you can elaborate uh and and have this uh perspective shared as well and your feelings how how it went uh what's the, the what are the learnings uh and that that can be shared from from that particular experience too okay and, and that's a very good question Luis Felipe. and maybe i'll start on when it comes to regulatory i will uh, refer to a previous comment by another speaker that is autumn that the legislation is clear uh, and, and here goes a big thank you to all CTN and Bio members, uh, current and from the past, we have one, uh, Professor Patricia. But when it comes to the process, uh, I would say that the process is clear. And, and Global East was actually the very first company to have a, a case examined uh, back in 2018 uh, with what was a kind of a first of a kind of one of the most innovative uh, uh, legislations to evaluate uh, uh, what is called, uh, um, let's say, advanced techniques for modification, combining the utmost, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, safety uh, uh, procedures, uh, but at the same time have a look on what was the scientific innovation. Uh, so what Global is say, and here goes back to the synergy, is not only about getting a case examined and with a positive evaluation by Citini Bio. So in that case, Global East was the first to have a, a, a yeast strain uh, examined by Citini Bio and say, well, using the techniques and uh, examining it according to our legislation, that's not a GMO. So that was the outcome. Uh, but the synergy came when we translated, how do I use my techniques to match a market need. And here's again where I do see a strong collaboration between Brazil and Flanders as we talk about biotech. So uh, having the tools alone uh, is not a solution. You need to combine with market expertise. And when it comes specifically to biotech, quite often the market needs are not translating into this is the specific gene modification that I need to have. So uh, uh, the problems are there to be solved and you need to combine, uh, uh, let's say, different backgrounds, different expertise to try to translate a problem uh, into, uh, uh, let's say, the technical tools that you have uh, in place. Uh, once you do this on the technical level solution, have a market solution, have a let's say, a legislation compliance solution, those are all part of when it comes to a product. So that was a very good experience in terms of, uh, um, let's say, a small company submitting, uh, uh, let's say, a dossier or uh, uh, to CTN Bio being examined, uh, being exposed to a process that is crystal clear, very rigid, uh, uh, very severe. <laughs> so you really need to do your homework. Otherwise, as uh, Otto mentioned before, you will kick it out by the rules, uh, but that was a very good example on combining a translation of a market need, uh, tools in, when it comes to R&D, uh, and the compliance with the legislation uh, to submit to CTN Bio. Uh, and that was also, let's say, a sort of a validation uh, uh, because Global East was the first, but several other companies came later combining the most advanced scientific knowledge that we have so far with the strongest and most severe uh, safety procedures. So we're not giving up. I think that is the future as we advance. You not necessarily need to give up on safety and environmental issues. Um, much on the contrary, you even put them uh, on a stronger position while combining uh, with advanced techniques. And, and here is a perfect example where you have a sort of, a, uh, let's say, a, a prisma with multiple sides 
difficult to dis, uh, to separate what was a Flemish contribution, a Belgian or Brazilian. I think that was a teamwork uh, combining uh, 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 the very best of each part and making something that was unique. Uh, that's absolutely uh, great to hear in terms of uh, a practical example of going through the process. Uh, I think that uh, combining um, yours and, uh, and Autumn's uh, um, speech on this, uh, now uh, we will begin our roundtable, Marcelo, thank you very much, but I will, I will use that, uh, that particular aspect of, uh, of uh, your, your own particular speech and, and Autumn's to pose the first question to uh, the four of you, uh, and that question is going to be related to uh, having uh, a strong institutional uh, framework, uh, a clear one, and uh, in this current world of uh, fake news, um, how do we um, how do we work? to strengthen even further our institutions in a time that many of them are not talking about sitting bio in particular, that, but that many of them are actually uh, being challenged in, in, in many ways. So uh, trust in our institutions is important. Uh, so I would like to hear from all of you, uh, what do you think about this in, in the biotech context? Uh, I'm pretty sure that Patricia will probably have some comments about that. Uh, so my question is um, uh, security, uh, legal security and regulatory security uh, as, as a big important issue uh, for uh, advancing biotech. I would like to hear your thoughts, uh, not necessarily uh, repeating, oh, well, it's important or not, but perhaps uh, giving further examples or even uh, addressing any particular uh, other aspect of this discussion as well. So the floor is open for all the four of you on this question. Uh, also, anybody from the audience can can send your questions now. Uh, I have a, a couple of others, uh, so uh, we'll start from there. Uh, any volunteer to talk about that? I, I would just like to start thanking uh, Autumn and Marcelo as a member of CTN Bio. I'm really glad to hear them saying that, that it was the, the law, the, 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 the legislation at CTN Bio, other regulations are crystal clear. This is very nice for us to hear you saying that. And that's what we try. We really try to do that. And that's and people really say that, that every process that enters city and bio are approved. And they are really, most of them are approved. We have several are uh, not just, they, they go back and forth and you know that they go, some of them are go back and forth, but most of them are really approved. And why they are, because they, we do, tend to make our regulations very, uh, we discuss, we make groups to discuss, and we then we go and make it open for the public, and then we came back and we discuss further, and we, then we have all these questionnaires, and also when the, the company or the university, because we say company, that, but also have from the, uh, the companies are public or, or private. We have the, the people from City and Bio, the, 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 the works at the City and Bio, that they look at the, the process first. And they look and they see things that are not correct and they go before they are analyzed through the members, they go and say, hey, this is not right. You should write it better. You should. You need to put more uh, documents and things. And sometimes when we have the process in our hands, we, t we go and say, well, go and talk to the company and ask them this. This is not uh, 
Right. This is not complete. I do not, I'm not understanding this very well. They do not write this. So when we go with the process to the, the meeting, to the city and by meeting, we already read and discussed and, and they exhausted. And then we discussed with the, with the members. You see? So that's not that we go there and so, and it's, but it, in the end, it's also nice that we hear them saying that the, the legislation, the regulation are clear because we try to do it together. And so. Anybody would like to uh, add to that or, or any perspective from you, perhaps uh, from Dr. Powell's uh, in, in sure. Europe as well? Yeah, so maybe I, I can I can add to that and, and put indeed a European perspective. So, well, one of the things uh, to answer your question is, is uh, I've talked about uh, the research uh, of VIB, but of course VIB is active in in much more than that. So also science communication is I think one of the very key goals of of VIB. And so regarding the um, regarding um, genetic modification, but also the new plant breeding techniques. Um, VIB is very active uh, in at the European level um, in informing um, not only the public but also policy makers uh, and I think that is very important uh, especially uh, I think most of you will know the the, the current situation of, um, of GMOs but also of gene edited uh, uh, organisms in Europe and I think we are a very crucial uh, year ahead uh, um, so, um, so at the moment, the European Commission has uh, ordered, an, uh, uh, let's say, an, um, an investigation uh, on new plant breeding techniques. And this report is uh, due to April uh, next year. And this will undoubtedly be followed by a political discussion on uh, how to regulate these new uh, plant breeding techniques in Europe. And I think VIB is really doing an effort there. Um, also uh, trying to group uh, the researchers in Europe. Um, we have, um, we are participating in a project called EU SAGE and I can, I can send the link if, if somebody is interested. It is really grouping, I think it's now 130 uh, plant research institutes in Europe uh, to really inform uh, policymakers on these new uh, plant breeding techniques. Huh? Uh, and um, so I think that is very important uh, to um, to do at this moment in, in Europe. Yes, uh, 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 Dr. Powers, I think uh, if I may uh, connect to a question from from the audience here on this particular topic, uh, it's a question from uh, Mr. Ricardo Rodriguez. Uh, he uh, mentions that uh, over the last 20 years uh, there has been a decrease uh, of global agriculture R&D investments in Europe, um, he says here from 30 to 10 percent. Um, and uh, he's asking exactly on that particular point that uh, by treating genome added product as GM products, uh, there has been an exodus perhaps of uh, biotech companies uh, to other uh, jurisdictions such as the USA. Um, and of course, uh, he will, his question is basically how is how Flanders and Belgium, uh, probably Europe, um, is, is trying to uh, keep or attract uh, plant biotech companies and investments to Europe uh, with this uh, with this background of um, of uh, legislation interpretation. Yeah, well, of, of course. Indeed, gene editing um, will be important for the future of plant research in, in Europe. That is, that is, of course, clear. But I would actually uh, would say that in, in Flanders, uh, uh, despite uh, indeed already currently with, with GMOs, uh, the legislation in Europe, that we are very strong in this, in this area and that we have been able to keep uh, R&D, uh, but also R&D investments in, uh, in our area. And I think the reason is, uh, I think there are multiple reasons. I think I think talent is one of them. Eh? We are with VIB and the universities. We are really, um, really, I can say, top in research in in this area, um, and this culture of investments. 
And so I, I think um, an example I, uh, it's already mentioned by Dirk in the introduction is that we even if, if companies from the US setting up uh, branches in Ghent, like Inari Agriculture, uh, because of these reasons, eh? so a good climate for investment uh, and and this talent that is uh, available. So I think it not does not necessarily uh, lead would lead to an exodus. Eh? Uh, but of course, uh, I think the opposite is true. Uh, I think, of course, if the legislation would be um, more, uh, let's say, uh, permissive for uh, gene edited crops, this I think would really uh, would lead to a boost. I think even more in, in in our area. I would I would rather see it like that. Well, that's a uh, very I, I, sorry. I have a question. Sorry, Filippi. Uh, Go ahead. Any perspective of action regarding the legal decision about yeah. gene editing? Yeah. Uh, so the, the because it's not the technical. Yeah. No, no. It's, it's, I, I expect this question because it's very important, of course. I think for for many companies in Brazil as well. So, so the <clears throat> the situation is as follows. So the European Court of Justice has uh, has ruled that with the current legislation, how it is written uh, on GMOs that gene edited crops uh, will fall under, under that legislation. And it is being debated still, but, but let's, let's assume that, that, uh, that this is the case. Um, this, we cannot go into appeal on that. This is the highest court in Europe. So the next step is a politi political decision. And so the European Commission is, is looking into that and is now indeed um, requested this, this uh, document uh, uh, to look into these new plant breeding techniques. And the idea is that after uh, this report, there will be a political discussion uh, on to change the, legisla to change the legislation. Uh, yeah. um, so anyway, it will, it will take some time, yeah, so. Well, uh, this is uh, this is a long discussion. Sorry, uh, Patricia. Yeah. Go yeah, ahead. Yeah, just Lawrence. Uh, the same thing applies, Lawrence, for microorganisms in in Flanders, or do you have a special? Mm, I, I I will not make any um, comments on that. It's it's something that. Uh, we have been discussing internally as well if this is the case. So uh, I cannot really uh, comment, comment on that uh, uh, at this moment. Yeah. yeah. It's of course always uh, not easy, these legal uh, discussions, of course. Eh? Mm -hmm. um, I, think, I think this discussion could take a whole webinar of, uh, yeah, of yeah. its own. Yeah. <laughs> but not with the lawyers because it would be very boring. Uh, with you guys, it's much more interesting. No question about that. Um, so uh, we are almost at the end of our webinar, but I have a final question. And after this final question, I'll, I'll close um, the, the webinar and thank you all. Uh, my question is more, let's say, positive towards uh, thinking of the future and, and biotech in agriculture. Uh, in the next five to ten years, in your views, uh, what do you see as, in, uh, as issues, problems that we have that may be solved or mitigated uh, through biotechnology, considering what's what you know about pipelines and and of course uh, uh, about about problems in general. It doesn't have to be connected only to Brazilian agriculture. It can be anything that uh, can be applied globally, and uh, of course uh, things evolve from there. So five to ten years, I would say, probably. Uh, 10 years, uh, it's a generation's time uh, uh, as uh, people account for. So if you can comment on that, uh, it will be very nice to close this webinar. Um, so floor is yours again. Well, maybe uh, again, again, from a European perspective, I think that the horizon that you mentioned 10 years is interesting because um, the European Commission also just uh, a couple of months ago formulated their um, from uh, farm to fork uh, strategy. I don't know if people are aware of that. It's, it's actually part of this, this huge uh, European Green Deal. Um, and uh, regarding agriculture, they want to reduce uh, uh, pesticide use uh, in the European Union by 50% in 10 years time 
and fertilizer used by 20% in 10 years' time. So this is a, a huge challenge. Um, and the interesting thing is that uh, although these goals are, are indeed stated, uh, it doesn't really um, make clear how we are going to meet those goals. And so I think there's a huge opportunity there for, for biotechnology and, and, and agri-science in general, I think, to, um, to contribute to that. Yeah? And um, what what interesting thing is that plant breeding uh, per se is not not really mentioned in the document, but uh, but the, the there is some reference to the new plant breeding techniques. So that I think that's something that that makes us hopeful that uh, also the European Commission is considering also those in their uh, let's say uh, ten year strategy here. Yeah. Uh, uh, I see talking specifically about uh, industrial biotech. Uh, I, I see there is a lot of fuel on here. So if we see that today already, we see some trends like, uh, uh, let's say, plant-based type of meat, uh, cosmetics, products. Uh, so a yeast not only produces the ethanol that powers Brazil and the beer that makes us happy, especially when it's a Belgian beer. <laughs> Uh, but it's also what we call a highly specialized small manufacturing unit. So it is the house to produce from vaccines to nutraceuticals to special products. So we do see a need uh, not only to valorize if you are, let's say, a, a farm farmer producer, but as society, we are demanding less, let's say, environmental intensive products from, again, from cosmetics to what we eat. Uh, to the protein, so uh, uh, what used to be just feed co-products by a beer manufacturer, today they are turning into a high protein content for nutrition. Uh, so I do see that we are, we will need and we will benefit from advanced biotech and when it comes to industrial biotech, we're going to see more than we see already because today, specifically in Brazil, one third of our energy comes from, uh, uh, from fermentation, from industrial biotech, and this will only increase in terms of the benefits that we already have from uh, uh, biotech. Uh, this is already happening and it will only become more intense in the coming five to ten years. Great, I, I really appreciate your uh, bio-industry uh, bio perspective, Marcel, and uh, uh, to add to you, I'll send you a question from the audience in private. Uh, there is a question from uh, uh, from Belgium, from Mike Hartel. Uh, it's a possibly a business opportunity uh, uh, to explore too. So I'll send that in private to you. Uh, I think I interrupted. Uh, I don't know, Autumn. Was that you that you wanted to speak? Yeah. Perspective for agriculture is totally connected with climate change and the consequence on that and the diseases, pests and, and even drought tolerance and things like that. But it's just to to put my part on that. Thanks. Um, if uh, I think that's uh, that's it for us to 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 keep on time. Uh, I think we did a great job. Uh, I would like to thank you, the four of you. Uh, each one of you deserves a webinar uh, um, almost alone because you have so much to contribute in many different aspects. Uh, but this has been, uh, at least to me, very pleasant and enjoyable. Um, I would like to uh, give my final remarks only. And uh, uh, Dirk, if you if you'd like to uh, close this as a uh, as representative of Flanders Trade and Investment. My final remarks are basically a, a big thanks to Flanders Trade and Investment, to our speakers, to the audience, uh, and um, uh, like everybody else, I remain available for any conversation on the matter. Uh, and we are on time. Thank you very much. Great job again. Uh, so, Dirk, if you want to close, uh, the floor is yours again, or uh, I I will just uh, finish this. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Luis Felipe. Um, well, I follow you in uh, thanking uh, all the participants. Uh, I really think we had a very nice lineup. Uh, I thank all participants taking more than 
two hours out of a very busy uh, schedule, it's not uh, obvious. So a big thank you uh, for that. I think uh, we uh, we uh, touched upon quite some interesting uh, topics here. Uh, the ongoing uh, efforts which are already uh, happening uh, with uh, between VIB and different Brazilian institutes are extremely interesting and inspiring, I would say. So, um, yeah, as I said in the beginning, uh, this is just an, an, an appetizer. We can uh, do seminars like this and enter into more specifics uh, every week. Uh, so what I would I would like to hear from you some feedback on what else can be done or what do you expect uh, from the other side? So uh, let's let's uh, build on this and um, hope to see you guys uh, soon. And once again, a very, very, very big thank you uh, on the screen. You see uh, the um, the emails of uh, all participants. Um, also from Luis Felipe and myself. So please don't hesitate to, to contact us uh, if you want further information or uh, you have some uh, uh, ideas on academical or commercial uh, uh, opportunities. Please feel free. Um, we are here to stay for a few years. So uh, thanks once again and I wish uh, the, the agro sector and the biotech sector, both in Belgium and uh, Brazil, uh, all the best. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Congratulations for the initiative. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks. Thank you very much. Bye bye.